The William W. Hay Railroad Seminar Series is sponsored by the National University Rail Center here at the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign. On behalf of all of us, we thank the USDOT for their ongoing support. It is greatly appreciated by those of us here on campus, as well as those of you participating via the internet. I have a list. Uh, let me welcome those of you who are joining via the internet. Uh, today it includes representatives from quite a large number of organizations. Uh, Federal Railroad Administration, uh, Hatchmont McDonald, Banesh, Lochner, LTK Engineering, TUV Rail Sciences, Metra, uh, Parsons, ESI, Kimikata Rail Consulting, Railstar Engineering, Illinois Department of Transportation, Hanson Professional Services, uh, North Carolina DOT Rail Division, Patrick Engineering, Trans Systems, Arcadis, Charmin Associates, Michigan Tech University, and National Association of Rail Passengers. Uh, we welcome all of you and um, really glad you could join us today. And um, uh, a reminder that if you want to receive um, PDHs for your participation today, please remember to send Emma an email uh, at the uh, uh, email address in the uh, seminar announcement. Well, the Union Pacific Railroad is the largest railroad in North America, and in order for them to keep their operations fluid and effectively serve their customers, UP must develop solutions to a wide variety of unique engineering challenges. Development and implementation of these solutions is the responsibility of UP's engineering department. They are continuously evaluating potential improvements to their procedures and developing new strategies for infrastructure maintenance and upgrades. Currently, they are engaged in next generation research on key infrastructure areas to improve operations and reduce variability in performance. By implementing these new and advanced technologies, the objective is to reduce maintenance requirements and lengthen life cycles, thereby providing additional value to Union Pacific shareholders. Our seminar today will highlight several of these technologies and the R&D projects that have driven their development. We're very fortunate to have a highly qualified speaker on this topic today. Ken Sito is the Senior Assistant Vice President of Maintenance and Renewal in UP's Engineering Department. He's a civil engineering graduate from The Ohio State University with 40 years of rail engineering experience. During this extensive career, he's held a variety of management positions throughout the UP system as well as at their headquarters. He currently leads their field engineering maintenance operations, including all track renewal programs and also supports daily maintenance activities for the railroad. Please join me in welcoming our speaker today, Mr. Ken Sito, who will present the William W. Hay Railroad Engineering Seminar entitled Union Pacific Railroad's Engineering Strategy and Technology Overview. Sounds like it, Sounds like it is. All right. Thank you, Chris. You make me sound a lot better than what I really am. Uh, and I'm a little bit worried about the individuals that are listening in on uh, on the, on the phone because it, they're also a very uh, distinguished group. Uh, I'm kind of a little bit anomaly to talk about uh, technology. I've spent most of my years in the field. I've been the recipient of the technology that has been performed and done. And uh, I sometimes have very good opinions of when we use new technology and I also have opinions of when I didn't think the new technology didn't work as well as I wanted it to. Uh, I think uh, 30 years ago, or not a little bit more than 30 years ago, in 1980, I was lucky enough to attend a seminar, or basically a two-week class, at the University of Illinois that was put on by uh, Mr. Hay, Dr. Hay. And uh, although uh, that was a few years ago and my memory isn't as good as it used to be, one of the things that I remembered from Dr. Hay was this, that railroads were built, they all, we all, we can, they've been around for a long time, and as engineers, as maintenance engineers, we need every edge we can get to make sure that we can maintain it. The reason he, he talked about that was we were talking about the bending moment on a 115 pound rail versus a 136 pound rail. And the bending moment is very, very little difference in them. So you said, why don't we just use 115 because it would be cheaper to use or more cost effective to use 115 pound rail instead of the 136. And uh, Dr. Hay said, at the tonnage that we're going to be going to, you need every edge that you can get 
to reduce maintenance and extend the life cycle. And that's a little bit what I wanted to talk about today, was extending the life cycle for uh, Union Pacific. Got to go through my pages here. I don't have this memorized. But if you look at this, our, op our operation is meant to have a safe operation conditioning for our employees, for our customers in the communities. That's what our goal is. And as railroad engineers and other railroads, all of us should be, per should be pointed to this. We need to make sure that we take care of our communities that we go through. We need to take care of our customers and our employees. At the same time, we want to minimize our train delay, and we, min we want to min minimize our slow orders, and we mi also want to minimize the footprint. Every time we go out there to do a track renewal, every time you go out there to fix a slow order, you're affecting the product. We are a railroad industry, and our industry is delivering material. It is not maintaining railroad. And although that's what we're here for, we're all out here going to fix that railroad, that's not our job. Our job is to deliver a product to our customers safely. And we need to do this cost effectively. Now when you talk about railroad, this is a big slide. I don't want you to read all that, but it basically it results in a couple things. Rail, ties, ballast, and subgrade. Doesn't matter what we do out here, all the technology, that's what we have to deal with every day. And all the science and all the things that we study, all the new technology, it's about making sure the life cycle on those items extend. At Union Pacific, we've put together this uh, capital cycle. Basically, we install the railroad right up here in the front, and then you go through a cycle of the track, you inspect it, you do daily maintenance, and then you get down here where we call it the intervention zone, where we come in, we do a undercutting, surfacing, ties, rail, and we bring it back up to this level, and you go completely through the cycle again. Our object as engineers and maintenance experts is to extend this cycle. How do you extend that cycle? All the new products and the technology that we have out here, if we can't extend that cycle, we're not achieving our goals. The Union Pacific, we work through a track assessment cycle. We go out, we assess the track every year. You know, you have your rail detection cars, your evaluation cars. We have uh, individuals that walk, walk the track, assess the ties, all, and we keep track of everything. You, through that, we predict when we need to do a next uh, uh, renewal. We do the renewal, and we start the whole process over. This is kind of a, you know, it just it just goes on and on and on. But the whole thing is always to extend this cycle. And if we can do that, the less interventions that we have out there on our railroad, that helps us provide a better product. At Union Pacific, we go through this process. As a matter of fact, we just, we do this each year. We take the data, our centralized engineering group takes the engineer, all this data that they've had, and they'll say, we think we need to put ties in here, we think we need to do, uh, we need to replace the rail at this location, we need to do undercutting here. And then we have a field group, which is where I used to spend a lot of time out, out in the field. It's the regions. They gave me a whole bit, they would give me a whole list of ideas of where they thought we needed to do work, and I gave them my ideas. Sometimes we agreed, sometimes we didn't agree. So we'd go through and we'd talk and we'd work it out, and then afterwards we'd come through and we'd, we'd develop a plan for this next year. We're going through that right now at Union Pacific. At the end of May, we're going to have a plan of what we're going to do in 2017. At that time, we get with our network development group because this plan up here, again, that's engineers, maintenance engineers, understanding that we want to fix this railroad and make it better. Our planning group, our network planning group says, you can't do that much work at that location. That'll affect our customers' product or our product to our customers. So then we have to go through that cycle with each other to figure out where we should be working, where we can work without a big impact to the railroad. It all happens because we have to make sure that we work this whole system together to develop, or not develop, but to, to provide a product to our customers. Again, I wanted to tell you afterwards, we'll have 
uh, question and answering. So I'm going to kind of run through a lot of these slides pretty quickly. And I know there'll be, a, I'm hoping that there's some questions that they get too technical, I'll, uh, we'll just push them off. Because remember, I'm a guy that used to put in ties by hand and uh, worked out in the field. And a lot of the technology my former boss was real good at, and I just had my gut feeling. So we'll do some of that. But basically, tie, oops, ties. The wood tie. 1865, that's when Union Pacific started building uh, west, going west out of Omaha. In 1986, we uh, started using concrete ties. Currently, we have 10 million plus concrete ties in our railroad, almost 4,000 miles of concrete ties. In 1998, we started to use uh, composite ties. Starting off with the wood tie. Some of the issues we have on the wood ties is the headwinds that are out there. There's a lot of discussion, a lot of old railroaders and, and even new railroaders, railroaders will tell you, oh, there's issues with the concrete tie, there's issues with the, the composite tie. Let's just deal, let's just go back and use wood. Well, the quality of ties are not, a good as, is, are not as good as they used to be. That's one of the headwinds that we have to be dealing with. Uh, a month ago, I was out walking behind one of our tie, tie renewals in the southern portion of our railroad, and I found us taking out ties, extensive amount of ties that we installed in 2002. That's 14-year tie life with a tie. That, that means that we're, if you're looking at renewing ties every uh, third of the ties uh, every cycle, our cycle on that, on that subdivision is every four to five years. We can't live with that as a railroad. The other thing is the environmental pressure on creosote. We are just starting to feel the environmental pressure. I personally think that within my lifetime, you will not be able to dispose of creosote ties without burying them and pay extensively to bury them. They also have the solid wood sawn, or the solid wood. Basically, right now we're in a housing, it's a housing downturn. Housing down, if it turns and we start building more houses, the, the cost of wood is going to go up. Again, I talked about the disposal cost, the heavy axle loads that we're using now versus in the past, and then, we, again, the renewal footprint. Every time you have to go back in there to renew that railroad, you're, getting, you're, you're delaying trains, you're causing customer dissatisfaction. Some of the tailwinds on the wood tie, borate. I'll talk a little bit about borate in the, uh, a little bit later on here. But the borate can buy some time. Also, again, we're a believer, or some of us are strong believers in the composite tie. I think that they have the best uh, uh, total cost of ownership for wood tie replacement. And then the, com the composite tie, the only issue that we have with the composite tie that we felt so far is we've had some uh, tie quality issues. Start off with a little bit our wood tie assessment. We get, across our, we get across our whole entire system. Heard, you heard uh, Chris talk about 32,000 miles. We walk all 32,000 miles with these individuals about every three to four years, rating every single tie. And then you go across it, and it's either bad, it's, good, it's fair, good, or excellent. And then we'll set, up tie, we'll set up tie programs to go in and replace those where we have an extensive amount. We'll replace all the bad ties. We'll replace fares according to a specific logic that we produce, and then we leave the goods and the, and the excellence in the track. The object there is to set up a cycle to where we can come back on an appropriate basis to where we come back and replace ties before we put slow orders on. During the tie pro, another technology that we are using is when the tie programs are going in during tie replacement on wood ties, we're using a wood tie plugging compound on those locations where we have loose spikes. We'll pull the spike, we'll fill it with a plugging compound. We think that this is going to help us extend that cycle. And those ties that are a little bit uh, on the edge, it'll extend the life of those ties. And we've had some very good, uh, very good uh, results from this. The borate treated tie, talked about that a little bit here. 
we feel that this is going to extend the life of the ties. Uh, other railroads have been using those, using the borate tie here for several years. We started it uh, last year, a little trial, and we expect to put in 800,000 borate ties in 2016. This also uh, reduces the amount of creosote that's used, and this is especially effective in high decay areas. So that area where I got, uh, where my ties are only lasting 14 years, hopefully this will make them extend the life of them to 20 to 25 years. Back there when we were talking about our tie assessors, we're starting to use this, uh, we're hoping to use this Georgetown Aurora system. It's an x-ray, to go out an x-ray, we're hoping that this will eliminate the need of the assessors walking across the railroad, which will be safer and it'll also be more effective. This will actually, we're hoping to be able to tell, find the good, the bad, the uh, ugly ties and the, uh, and the excellent ties and help determine our tie programs using this system. One of the good things about this is it'll be recordable. We'll be able to find how the tie degrades year over year over year as we, as we run this across our system because it'll be, it'll be kept in a database and we'll be able to look at it from one year to the next. Composite ties. Composite ties, again, we started using in, uh, in the late 90s. Uh, this, this little section that you're looking at right there, that's on our Pine Bluff subdivision that runs from Pine Bluff, Arkansas, down through uh, Texarkana all the way to Big Sandy. These ties right here that you're looking at were installed in 2001, and if you took them out, they don't look much different than the day that they were installed. Now. We've also got ties that, composite ties that we have installed that have only lasted six years. There's a material quality of the manufacturing process, and once we get that determined, I think you're going to see more and more usage of uh, composite ties. Right now, we are, we're doing a test. We have a trial up on our uh, South Morrill and uh, Chester subdivision where we're testing several of the different types of composites to figure out which ones are the best. Currently, we got three vendors that we're testing, Axiom, Carbon Lock, and Integro. And uh, I've been told that there are other companies that are starting to come into this, into this product, to, uh, which is kind of good to know because the more companies that we can get in here, the possibility of lower costs in the future for or the product. We feel that a long-term solution to the volatility of our wood tie program is, is the composite tie. Concrete tie strategy. Okay, our concrete tie strategy is our, the regular tie that we have out there, plus we also have the recessed tie seat, which is good to be, which is usable in curves, and the, the bridge, we're going to also have a bridge approach tie that we're looking out there that's a little bit bigger, uh, gives much more foundation. This, uh, this recessed rail seat, it basically saves on the, the, uh, the posts and the insulators because it, it'll, it'll provide more, pre or more uh, bearing pressure for the rail and we feel it'll help us with our gauge problems. Uh, one of the issues that we had earlier years was the tie pads. We think we have a very good tie pad now that has eliminated that. We also feel that our rail seat problem, we figure that we know how to make uh, rail seat uh, repairs and uh, we're also looking at uh, finding good sp Specialty ties, someone to build our switch ties and, uh, like I said, the, uh, the bridge approach ties. 14% of our main line is, is concrete ties. And if you look at that, even with, we've had some issues with the quality of our ties recently, but we're, uh, those ties is, is keeping us from putting in about $80 million worth of wood ties a year, the concrete ties that we're using. I think, I think concrete ties have a place in the, in the railroad industry. Uh, you just have to make sure you have the right place for them. Here's a picture of the, uh, of the, uh, rail, the rail seat ones, and you can see right there where, the, where it gives you the, on the, on the outside, where it gives the rail seat is, is suppressed, so it gives you that increased, increased uh, 
help on the rail. And we have two of them, the Voslo and the Pandro in that area. Rail management. In rail management, you have friction management, you have rail grinding, you have welding, you have testing, and you have uh, the, the surface, uh, surface failure management. These all help to do our rail strategy at Union Pacific. We use all this information, bring it into one location, and try to help determine where we want to do our uh, rail replacements. If you look at this, some little history about or interesting facts about Union Pacific, we got about, we still have 39, almost 4,000 track miles of 115 pound, five and a half inch base rail. We got uh, 9,000 miles of 133, 11,000 miles of 136, and 4,000 miles of 141 pound rail. That kind of gives you an idea of the types of rail that we have out there. Jointed, we're getting down to where we have very little jointed rail left. And Right now we're about 1,200 miles and hopefully in the next few years that will be completely eliminated. Last year we ground 22,000 miles and we expect to grind more than that, close to 25,000 miles of grinding this year and we our detector cars have tested 134,000 miles, should be closer to 140,000 miles of testing this year. Our top defects are the, uh, the DFs. And the SSCs, that's, a, uh, that's, our, that's what we call a, a surface uh, defect, and then the, D, the welds. DFW is the defective welds, both plant and field welds. Our logic on replacement of rail, on how we figure out where we want to replace rail, where we're going to spend, how much we're going to spend. We run all this through the different routes that we have. We have a critical routes, we have premium routes major routes and other routes. We look at a, we have a replacement logic that's built over two years of uh, defects found by the detector cars and also by the uh, service failures. We keep track of all that and we put it together. We use, uh, we have a risk index on, on every mile of our railroad, determine the, the, the risk on effects to water risk, risk, uh, city risks, in uh, population risk, uh, environmental sensitive area risk, we, we put that all together and come away with a rail program to minimize risk, minimize uh, defects, minimize uh, service interruptions. On our, on our curve rail, we now go out with our, de our evaluation cars, which that's a picture of our evaluation car, it's taking pictures of our rail all the way across the system. That's what you're seeing up here, and this, this is pictures of the rail. And uh, it'll tell you how much wear we have. Then we also, then it gives us a candidate list of rail, cur curve rail that we need to go out and look at every year. Right now, our curve, uh, our curve doctors, which is an affectionate term that we use for our uh, curve inspectors, they're going out and they're measuring the curve, looking at all the defects to just make sure it's meeting the requirements, and then we put together a, a, a program for the next year. This, this, in, this detailed inspection, along with uh, friction management, has helped us to d reduce our rail program uh, by 50% in the last seven years. Track welding and strategies. Track welding is basically the strategies that we have on, on welding is how do we reduce the risks? How do we train our welders better? How do we get the right material to do them? And how do we evaluate what they're doing? We also have how do we get better welds to extend the life of the weld in the rail? And then also reducing the weld inventory and the cost. That's, that's the long rail. One of our strategies right now is a head weld. There's two types of head welds that are out there on the market. There is the uh, thermite head weld, and then there's also the electric uh, flash butt head weld. Currently, we are not using the electric flash uh, well, but we are watching Holland as they uh, use it on uh, other other lines, and we're trying to determine how soon or when we want to bring that online. The one that we do like to use currently is our the thermite process, which basically you grind out the defect, and then you 
put a thermite uh, mold on and you do the weld and you grind it. The best thing about this is, is it doesn't cut the rail so you don't have a uh, rail neutral temperature issues. You never, get, you never lose your rail neutral temperature. Now currently we're only using this on subdivisions with less than 75 million gross tons and you have to train those welders that use this very specifically. So we have subdivisions or service units on our southern region, uh, one of them on our northern region, and one of them on our western region that is using this uh, method. We're also using a head-hardened thermite weld. Basically, this helps us after the thermite weld is done. We're doing a process to increase the, the, uh, the, the length and the life of the, of the thermite. It's, uh, it's making it... Um, increasing the, the, the rail strength, uh, getting rid of the softest that you receive when you do a rail, a thermite rail weld. Long Rail Initiative. This is, we started this in uh, 2014. Uh, we have been receiving rail all of last year. We're receiving uh, 400 foot rail lengths. 480 foot, basically, is what it is. And it comes in, and basically this graph right here at the top, uh, for a normal string of rail, which is 1,440 foot, it would normally take 17 plant welds. Okay, with a long rail, we've, uh, we've reduced that down to two plant welds, and then there'll be two welds in the, in the field. So an 88% reduction in welds. Well, the fact that that plant wells is one of our highest defects, this eliminates that possibility. That reduces the number of defects that you have in the field. Because a, the rail life is 4 billion gross tons, a weld life right now is 2 billion gross tons. So if we can eliminate those welds, there's less chance of uh, failures. Yes, Chris. Um, you mentioned that one of your highest sources of failures are the plant welds. Are they, I'm assuming they're not as high as the field welds, though? Not as high as the field welds, but the field welds is a field welding process. The, the plant weld is, it's just the life of the weld. Yeah. This is what, now, we're, we're starting to do some uh, post, uh, post heating uh, after the weld, but we're still, this has been one of our issues. And so the mo more of these welds that we can get out, the longer the rail will last. Our long welding plant, uh, we have a crane out there that can pick up the rails. It's, it's an eight overhead trolley unit. It's a four spread beams, 20 magnet heads. It's a, it's a very interesting machine to watch work. It's out in Stockton, California. And uh, it's really one of the first of its kind. Uh, the area out there can handle 46,000 tons of rail and storage, which is nearly 200 track miles. And uh, the, the best thing about this is we can weld a train in uh, two trains a week. That's 10 miles of welded rail that can go out to our railroad a week. I talked a little bit earlier about friction management. That's your, top of rail, that's your gauge face lubrication and your top of rail. The strategy here is that our, we have a central management team that, that handles this. Oh, it used to be handled by the local manager, and the local manager has a lot on their plate. It's the daily day defects that their track inspector finds. It's the defects that are reported by trains. And it's the other issues that take place. In, in filling up the lubricator and actually making sure that it's getting lubricating properly, it kind of falls way down on their list. So we centralized this a few years ago, and uh, these individual, the individual teams that we have in Omaha that are watching this, they're out testing, they're finding out, making sure how far the lubrication goes, how much the top of rail goes, and uh, we have, due to this, this along with our uh, inspection team, we feel, you can see that where we were Back in 2007, we were at 255 miles of curve rail. We're at 120 miles in 2016. And we think the more we do with head-hardened rail and the better we do with lubrication and top of rail, we're going to get that below 100 one of these days. 
And when you talk about interventions, you don't have to go out and relay a curve. That's one less intervention that you have to have. Rail testing and the, and the strategies here. Remember back there where we, did the, we were talking about assessments. This is all about, there's no doubt that the rail testing for rail, and then also later on here we'll talk about geometry testing. What that does is that's a good thing to go out there and find those immediate defects that you need to fix. But this is what we use to help build our programs in the future. All the data that we get from our rail testing and on our geometry testing, that's the data that we use to put things together that says this is where we need to have rail programs, this is where we need to go for tie programs and surfacing and undercutting. We have uh, several models that we use. As you can see here, one of the things we use, that we have Nordco uh, equipment, we have Sperry equipment, uh, we have uh, hand testing equipment. Uh, all of this helps us do a very good job about testing our rail. Along with that, we've got a small platform that we've uh, developed over in the last few years. The good thing about this, this is the same as the big trucks. I don't know how many of you have seen rail testing trucks. They used to be pretty good sized trucks. This is a much smaller truck. Uh, you can get up to almost eight miles an hour of testing. It's a solid defect detection, same as the big trucks, and it's a much lower cost of operating cost. And it can also be used pretty handily in yards and industry leads. Here, here's another one that we have not just developed, but we are using. It's Herzog and Sperry. They have these, uh, basically, these much, much smaller. These can get on and off the track at any location. Excellent to use in yards. Uh, as a former yard maintenance individual, uh, broken rails in the yard tracks was, is always a nagging issue. Here we can get across, we can get on and test a couple tracks then uh, fix those defects. Uh, maybe next week come in and few, test a few more. Uh, they have, we did one up in uh, Pocatello, Idaho where we were testing. They took, the region out there took one of these. Here, let's see, I think it was, this is theirs. No, this one's theirs. They took it into uh, the Pocatello yard, found something like 142 defects in their yard tracks. It was also one of their biggest causes of derailments in that yard over the last uh, few years was broken rails. So they fixed the 142 defects in the yard tracks, and it's going to help them in their broken rail derailments. We're also starting a high speed. We had a waiver we, we applied for and received a waiver from the FRA to do high speed testing. So you test the whole subdivision very quickly and it send, as it's testing it sends information back to a low, an, an off-site location. It analyzes the tests, sends it back out to a verification team that will go to just the spot. If you've ever tested rail, you know you're, you're competing with track time with trains, track inspectors, maintenance teams, the whole gamut of individuals. And you're just another individual that's trying to get that, that footprint. This allows a, the rail tester to get across the track quickly, find the defects, and then we can go in at the spot location and fix those defects. And, uh, as we find the defects, we can also remediate them quickly with slow orders and then come back again and start fixing them permanently. Yeah. Yes? In your text over there, you have um, uh, sort of about two-thirds of the way down, it says, as frequency of test progresses, anomalies, track structure, et cetera, is overridden, it reduces the number of false positives. Can you, can you, do you know more about what? I'll, I'll tell you, like I said, I'm not the tech expert yeah. here, but what I'll tell you on this is the faster you go across or the more you go across this subdivision, you start building that history, you can watch this defect to find out okay. if it's still there and if it comes back or if it's growing because we have a good tracking on this, on this defect. Okay. Yep. And sometimes you can, you get a lot of, you get a lot of false positives so, or you, know, you get a, you get a, it looks like there's a defect there and there's not. So this will allow that to continue to, to, to check it faster. The other thing about this is if we can increase the cycle time, or not increase, decrease the cycle time, 
So because this is less disruptive, we can get more testing done and we can get back sooner. So instead of coming back to the subdivision every 75 days, we might be coming back to the subdivision every 35 days. And when we are finding defects, they're smaller defects, instead of if we're coming back every 75 days and that defect has grown, takes long, it, we have to get it out quicker. Okay. Or it fails before we get back. Yeah, this is very exciting, obviously. Very exciting, and it's got lots of places. Yes? Ten miles an hour. I think that when the real issue is when I when I talk higher speed, what I'm, it just it, it's a continuous test, and you you've you've been on rail detectors or with rail detectors, they're always stopping, backing up, getting out, doing the hand test. There's a lot of back and forth with our normal rail detection operation. So this is a continuous test. Starts one mile post, ends. So it eliminates that, the track time. And we do a verif after the remote analysis is done, they come back with a verification in the field. If you want to know more about that, I'll get my rail experts here next time to do some talk about that, which would be good. Talk a little bit about geotech. You know, uh, we talk, I talked a little bit here earlier about how important it is to have ra good rail, how important it is to have good ties. But if you don't have a good subgrade, good rail and good ties are just not going to survive. Subgrade is the whole, is really the foundation of what you're building your railroad on. We're going to be using a, a ground penetrating ra radar system that we're using. We're going to be uh, starting to use that here this summer. It'll be running across on one of our evaluation cars, across our whole system, looking for a fouling index in the ballast section. This fouling index, go right to here, this is a really, this is a before and then this is an after, after we did the undercutting. And that place right there is right here. This is a, this is the 18 inches below the bottom of the tie. So this is about six inches. This little space is six inches, and this is six inches. So that's 18 inches below the bottom of the tie. And you'll see right here this dark blue. That's got a fouling index of 0.4. Well, that, that definitely is a surface issue if any of you have ever maintained railroad. So if we can find those locations below the bottom. I mean, any, I was real good at high railing and finding those muddy spots when I can see them on top of the rail or on top of the track. I could see those mud locations quickly. But seeing it down below the bottom of the tie, I wasn't very good at that. Here's a system now that can tell us that. And if we can get them here before they get to the top of the tie, that's one surface issue in uh, fouled ballast that we can get rid of before it starts causing us a surface defect. You can see after we, after we did the undercutting, this is, you can see the green, that whole area was cleared out. And this was just, we had, we had tested it. They were continuing on with their work going, going uh, this way. But that's an excellent way, an excellent tool for us to use in the future to figure out where we need to do undercutting operations and in, in, uh, ballast undercutting, surfacing, and in, in in shoulder cleaning. Talking about ballast renewal systems, we have basically three different types of uh, actions. You can use our tampers, which we have our cat tamping operation, and then just a maintenance operation. You can use shoulder cleaning, which you're going just a proactive approach where you're just cleaning your, you're doing shoulder cleaning. And then we have uh, major buck undercutting. And then we also have, what we have is our CBH, which is our crawler backhoe, where, where they'll do undercutting off track where they can come through with a device that's a, uh, that's a uh, long bar that undercuts underneath the track using a, an excavator. Track testing and assessment, talked a little bit about this. This is our geometry cars. Uh, geometry cars running across our whole system. We have two of them. The, we have two major cars like this and then we also use a Vista high rail. The Vista high rail is a high rail unit, so it's basically doing geometry testing 
gives you all the data that we do with our big car, but it's not, it's not under load. So the loaded, uh, the EC4 and the EC5 give us loaded measurements. This, uh, again, this was used to find the defects out there. Uh, I saw an excellent presentation here this morning finding our yellow tag defects and how to determine when they're going to be become red tag defects. Uh, so that's, this is not just used, though, for finding defects. We use this data to help us determine our surface uh, quality index, so where we need to surface in the future. This is also the device that we're using to help find, that's taking pictures of our railhead and railware, so we know about that. Um, it's, it, they're very amazing machines and help us determine our strategy for in the future. The next step, though, is the unattended geometry measurement. Uh, similar to what the FRA car has the, where they're out behind Amtrak, uh, we need to get, we want a fully automated uh, rail car that's, uh, the whole system is mounted inside the car, and it will be going across our system measuring and sending information to a, a location to tell us when we have defects and when we need to uh, do the repairs. If we can get the fully automated running across our railroad, we'll be working on yellow defects or yellow tags long before they become slow ordered. The high rail Vista, we use those on, uh, we use those trucks more on a industry lead, yard lead, uh, in locations when it's just uh, when you're behind with the evaluation car, it can come in and take care of a, a short location siding that you weren't able to get to the last time. When I'm talking about the uh, the car, this is our car that we have, and it will start. This is what it was before. This is what it looks like now. That's what the inside is, and we're gonna in May we will be deploying and start testing across our system. We're very excited about what the results are going to be with this. Again, standards and technology. It's building engineering effectiveness by improving our product and our processes. I was told someone the other day, it's real good, it's real easy to be a good engineer. And good engineers can build railroad day in and day out. Build a good railroad day in and day out. It takes excellent engineers, the type that this school produces, to maintain railroad. Maintaining is the toughest thing to do. Once it's there, you've got to go out there and figure out how to maintain it safely for your customers, for the community, and have very few interventions in the railroad. That's the challenge. Now I can open it up to questions. <laughs> Questions? Is that okay? Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was really interesting to hear about all the work that you guys have been doing. Uh, my question is about the composite tie program because I feel like when we hear from railroads, we typically end up hearing a lot more about concrete ties um, and not so much about composite ties. So, do you think that are, are you using composite ties? sort of in concert with concrete, but in very different application areas? Or do you see composite becoming the predominant tie type that you'd be using on UP? Composite tie has more of the, um, it's more like a wood tie. It can derail, you know, if you have a, uh, a car derails on it, it's not going to damage the composite tie. Derailed car on a concrete tie, as all of you know, has very, very, uh, uh, tough uh, results. Uh, composite ties can live in uh, the subgrade. Uh, the last six years before I moved to Omaha, I was uh, down on our southern region. Concrete ties in southern Louisiana do not, they, they just don't mix well. It, uh, so you can't, put you can't put the concrete ties down on that. The subgrade just doesn't exist. The composite tie works great. So the, the, the qualities are this close to the same on the the wood tie and the composite tie. So that's, I don't think, their concrete ties aren't going to replace everything, composite ties aren't going to replace things, but we need another product out there because the wood tie, I think the wood tie, there's going to be less, uh, it's just going to be more difficult to get rid of 
uh, wood ties as they, as they wear out. And a composite tie, if it does wear out, you just send it back, they chop it up, and they make a new one. That's my feeling. There's other people that feel differently. <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have a question on uh, adopting borate, treating your ties. Borate treating, yes. Yes, you mentioned that you are hoping that it takes you from 14 years uh, to give you to 20 to, 20 to 25 years. Uh, you're saying you sound like you are hoping that it does that. I'm asking if uh, there's no testing that has been done to assure you that it's going to give you those extended we, years. There are uh, other railroads have used them and they have been in track on those railroads for 20 to 25 years and they've had very, very good results with the borate treatment. And uh, so we feel very confident that we're going to get that life out of them. It's just that we're using them in a little bit tougher area, so we're just going to wait and see. But it's, uh, we feel pretty confident. If we're, going to, we're buying 800,000 of them this year, we feel very confident that they are going to work. Thank you. Uh, the same question about the composite sleepers, uh, ties. Uh, by the end of the next uh, year, European, they are, suppo they are supposed to stop the crystal treatment uh, wood tires. And uh, so the crystal uh, treatment tires is uh, almost uh, out of use all over the world. Not, but uh, in my opinion, the US is uh, some kind of lag behind the agenda to stop it. This is the first question. The next one is uh, composite uh, tires. Um, what is the price? I, I read from the Titex. It's about 42, 46 uh, US dollars per each. Um, but um, rel relatively about 10% higher than the wood sleepers. And uh, what is the economical benefit of the uh, wood tires? Very cheap in the US, but higher in some countries. And, uh, Concrete sleepers tires is some kind of expensive. Somebody told me that because of the moles, steel moles. Is that so? Because just 14% of use in the UUP, this is very limited. In China, we use almost 80%, more than 80% concrete sleepers. Very cheap, $30, $30. So, and another question about the composite sleepers. Uh, yeah, too many questions, I will, uh, consulted with you privately later. But um, uh, questions about the, um, uh, there are several problems in, for the composite sleepers, not only the price uh, very high relatively, but also, the, for example, the temperature sensitive, and some uh, because of the production uh, qualities, for example, the very dirty materials in the raw materials, so crack of the, um, Composite uh, ties. All right. And, uh, and so, so that's all. Okay. To, to answer, let me let me try to roll up all your questions into a into one consistent statement. Is concrete ties are high? They're the most expensive. They're a high cost, high initial cost, uh, long term. The total cost of ownership. We're still working through that. I think all the railroads are. Uh, I feel personally from my experience in maintenance that there are places for the concrete tie. Uh, we've, like, we, like I said earlier, we had pad issues, we had, uh, you know, base, uh, we had, <laughs> we had uh, sub, or subgrade issues with uh, how, to use, how to use the concrete tie, where to use the concrete tie, uh, and then we've run into some quality issues uh, with the manufacturing of the concrete tie. I think all those are surmountable. I think the concrete tie has a place in our industry, and we need to use those where the total cost of ownership uh, makes sense, especially in uh, uh, high curvature and grade territory. I think they work well there, and they work very well in dry climates. I think that a composite tie currently, the composite tie costs more than a wood tie, uh, especially in the United States. Uh, the obviously the total cost of ownership on the composite if you get it to the right price 
it will be it would be very good. Uh, the issue with the composite tie is the quality. Here again, where we've had where we have manufacturing variations, uh, I showed you some ties that have been in the track since 2001, no problems. Again, we have some that aren't lasting more than three to four years. So. Once we get over that hurdle and find that right tie and find the right supplier, I think you'll see more and more composites. But as you, as you pointed out, the creosote issue is, is looming out there, and as an industry, we're going to need to think about it. How do we handle that? My question actually already got asked to some extent, but just with those composites, I was wondering, like, what are the exact failure mechanisms? Like, was it rail seat deterioration or was it center cracking? And they, also, kind of like, what did you see any trends? Like, they fail more often in colder climates, or they fail more often in curves, or things like that. The only place that we've used them extensively is in southern climate, so we really haven't had issues looking at them in the freeze thaw. Uh, although we're trying it now up in our southern or our, our coal route, so we'll we'll start looking at those at that location. The failures have come from breakage right underneath the rail seat and breakage in the center. We have some over here. I should walk. I could walk around and give you my mic here, Master. <laughs> that would be a quick question. Uh, Quicker one than the one beside you there. <laughs> <laughs> I, certainly. Uh, one of the biggest problems in track uh, quality management is management of welds. And that is um, identification of defective welds and then replacing the defective weld. And there is always a question mark on the quality of uh, the thermit weld. Have we tried to use the electrical flash butt welding to replace a weld in field? The electric flash to, to replace it, the, the thermite? To yeah, to replace. Yeah, we use, we use field, well, um, the in-track welders, we have a lot of high rail in-track. We've used high rail in-track welders extensively. Okay. We do that. But even, even that weld uh, has issues. Uh, mm -hmm. it's, it's very similar to the plant weld, but so it doesn't last as long as the plant weld. Also, mm -hmm. there is a... There's a time and place to use in-track welding versus the field welding, the thermite process. Uh, thermite process, in my opinion, works very well in lower tonnage uh, yes. routes. Mm -hmm. uh, as you get into the heavier tonnage and uh, uh, um, a higher populated of joints or defects, using the uh, electric flash butt uh, becomes an economical process. But I, I also believe that in the right location, a good thermite process uh, lasts very a long time. And we've had, we have some thermites okay. that have been in the railroad for a long time. Again, okay. it, it, it'd really be nice if everything was the same. Every subdivision that we have out there has different tonnage. It has different subgrades, it has different traffic, it has different weather, and one tool, you just can't use a cut cookie cutter to fix all the problems. And you have to every, you have to determine where you use the right technique. Like I said, mm -hmm. we're good engineers and we can build good railroad, but how do we use the right technique at the right time to solve the right problem? And as, as engineers, we need to understand economics and we need to understand how to use those economics and the, and the tools that we have to fix the right problem. You know, sometimes we could go out there and we could take a piece of track, take it completely out, and, and really rebuild that mile of track so that we wouldn't have to do anything else again. Or we could surface it every other year. And surfacing it every other year would last a long time and the lower cost versus taking a whole piece of track out and completely rebuilding it. But sometimes you, if you have to surface it every month, maybe you need to take the track out and rebuild it. 
So that, that whole economic process needs to be done. I'm not good at the economic processes, but I know when to ask the, our economists and, and, and analysts when, when we need to do what and what's the cost. And that's what we need to be always conscious of. Does that answer your question? Yeah, in a way. Yeah. OK. Thank you. But yes, we do use in-track welders, field okay. in-track welders. Okay. And they're very successful. Mm -hmm. Uh, <clears throat> I have a quick question about the RFID technology. You mentioned about the 2016 evaluation plan for wood tie rating evaluation based on RFID. Yes. So is there any plan for concrete cross ties as such, like using RFID for crack detection? We, like we are, I didn't mention that, but we are currently using it to uh, analyze our concrete ties. So, but are they being used for like uh, degradation uh, assessment, like or yes. structural defects as such? Yes. Okay. Thank you. What he, what he asked was on the uh, Aurora system, or, uh, can we use it on concrete ties? And we have been using it on concrete ties, and it's been very effective. Yeah, did you have a question? Oh, okay. Well, we do have some questions from the online oh. audience. Let me uh, get over here, and I'll read them. Lots of interest in this topic. So the first question was whether you were using um, asphalt underlayment uh, anywhere? We have used asphalt underlayment on, uh, for road crossings. And we have used asphalt uh, underlayment on uh, crossing frogs. And we have used asphalt align, uh, underlayment on uh, some subgrade locations where we have had problems, repeat locations. And when the asphalt uh, underlayment is installed properly, it has been very effective. If, it's, if, you, if you don't take the time to install it properly, you'll have, you'll have a problem. So it really, it's the installation that's very important on the underlayment. Um, OK, another question is, um, I'm not sure if you mentioned this, but the question is, is um, how do you create sparkless rail cutting? Did you? Huh? We have, we're, well, one of the big issues that we have on our railroad, and I don't know, it, especially in Western Railroad, is the dry climate. And we are very, very concerned about fires, right-of-way fires, because right-of-way fire gets away from us. And we have had that experience that you have some very, very unacceptable consequences. Uh, we have a lot of uh, we have a lot of procedures in place that when you can cut the rail, when you can make the welds, when you can create sparks. So we have been searching pretty heavily uh, for a, a sparkless rail saw. The reason for it, if we can do that, then we can cut the rail and at least we can um, make repairs to start to be able to run trains. If you have a de detailed fracture or you have a service failure and it's not a nice straight break, if it's a, if, a, if the head's chunk, if you have a chunk of head rail head out of there for a foot or two foot, you have to cut in a piece of rail. And if you don't have, if you can have a sparkless uh, rail saw, almost one person can go out there and do the repair. So we're looking pretty extensively to find uh, a sparkless saw. Uh, I think we are close to finding that, and um, we hope to start implementing that uh, here in the future. Several more online. Our, our online audience is very engaged today. This is great. Um, so the next question is, um, back in the 80s and 90s, uh, fabric and geogrid were um, uh, very popular yes. for track maintenance, and uh, the question is, um, you know, here we are, uh, almost 20 years late, or more than 20 years later. Uh, did this? How did this work out? What's uh, what's your use of those products today on the Union Pacific? And let's see. I've used about a uh, hundred rolls or more of fabric in my lifetime, and um, there are places that it works. I think that there are better designs currently for the, the geo grid and the geo web, those we have used those. I think they have they have places in our uh, railroad industry. Um, like I said a little bit earlier, it's one of those things if it's used properly, I've used 
I've used the GeoWeb under crossing frogs and have had, been, have had very good success with those. I've used the GeoGrid uh, behind a uh, buck undercutter and have without the, uh, without the fabric, just the GeoGrid itself and have had very good success in that location. We had a location that we had to surface at least two to three times a year. We ran a buck undercutter and, and put the geo grid underneath that, and we reduced our interventions down to once a year. So I think there definitely is places for that. Um, the equipment that we have currently, uh, you know, your, your undercutters, there's really not a good way to distribute the geo grid underneath the undercutter, which would be, that, that makes it a little bit more helpful. Uh, again, constructing new, it can be used, and I think it does, uh, it's very effective, but so does building a very good sub-base, a good subgrade and sub-base. Um, I'm not, I'm kind of, there's places for it, there's places not for it, the geo, uh, the geofabric, I'm not sure is, uh, maybe it'll come back if we determine how to use it properly. I think a lot of times we punched a lot of holes in geofabric with tamper hits. So you got, if you get it deep enough, I think it'll do the job. Okay. Next question online is, um, based on the, um, on track geometry, and especially retaining track geometry performance uh, for heavy axle loads, uh, which type of ties do you think perform the best? You don't have to answer that. <laughs> it, it, I go back to the subgrade. Um, if it's a if it's a good subgrade, uh, where you have good drainage, I think concrete ties are going to be excellent in those locations. Uh, if you have southern Louisiana, you're not going to be able to use the concrete tie. So uh, you know, that's, that's the, uh, the engineering part about it. it. They do work. Concrete ties work, and they're good. Uh, wood ties work because they're resilient. Okay. Um, the other question seems to be, I think they're maybe looking for a little bit more explanation of your long rail program. Um, what has changed that allows you to eliminate the factory welds? I guess I'm not sure I understand whether what's, what's being Well, we haven't really eliminated the factory weld. Uh, ex is instead of having 17 of them in a 1,400-foot in section of rail, we only have two. So that we've eliminated 88% of the, or the, intra or the plant welds. That's, that's what we've helped out with. So we have less opportunities of failure. And that's because you're getting longer rail. Longer rail. The rail is, being rail. Is, the rail is uh, uh, coming by boat, boat from Japan, and it's in 480-foot sections. I think we also have a plant in the United States that also is uh, producing or going to be producing long rail. And um, that also will be helpful. Okay, uh, one, Whoop, another one question more. here. I know you mentioned you're not the tech guy, but I'm going to ask you something about the, the um, rail defect uh, detection measurements you guys do on, on the rails. Yes. Uh, I assume you guys are using ultrasound for, for all of those? Ah. Uh. I got it back there. There's two different ways that we're using. We have two different detection systems. Uh, one is the ultrasound, and um, I can't remember what the other one is. But uh, I can get that information to you. All oh, right, okay. after class or after class after the seminar. Sure. Well, stop <laughs> by. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, so on horizontal curves, which on horizontal curves where the bandwidth of the speed is a lot more. So how do you try to uh, reduce the wear and wear of the rails when the when there are range of speeds of trains? So how do you try to manage that? How do we 
how do we reduce the reduce or yeah how do you maintain it oh how do we maintain our railroad with all the different speeds of train over one section of track so you'll exactly. have a slow piece of, slow piece of track well if it's all tangent that's not a problem right yeah, on curves, yeah. okay that's that's the nice way the curved territory is where you have your your issues I'm going to sit down is that okay <laughs> so curved curved track so if you have a you have class 5 or class 4 track with curves in so you have your super elevation and but the problem is is that train that drags around is only going 40 instead of 70 miles an hour that's what you're concerned about and overloading the overloading the low rail and which causes you to have surface problems it wears out the low rail you have mud issues and it's all kind of problems right okay that's the maintenance problem so how do you figure out so you can use you can use super elevation you can use a one inch unbalanced two inch unbalanced some places you want to use uh, you want to use one inch unbalanced some places you want to use equilibrium if all your if all your trains hit the speed you want to use equilibrium or the one inch unbalanced if you have that differential going on you have to look at the railroad and you have to determine as an engineer or as a good maintenance man what should the what should that super elevation be and there's not one of the problems that I see on everyday work is I'll have that manager say well this is what it's supposed to be you know there's about there's there's about three different levels three to four different levels of super elevation that you can put in a curve and if one's not working you need to be looking at what the other one should be and then finally sometimes you may need to lower the speed of the high train high speed train to get a more uh, appropriate location or a more appropriate response from your track yeah I mean my question was like like there is sometimes underbalance sometimes overbalance so there is some track deterioration degradation so how do you actually maintain it you know like grinding oiling something lubricating which practice do you normally adopt the surface I mean you just it's the it's the how much and how often you want to surface that railroad and how often you want to improve the the drainage okay one more <laughs> I think the, I think we'll we'll take one last question one last question I'm really I think the interest is great thank you uh, maybe the last question I, I just want to ask uh, in UP how do you deal with the waste the tie that has been replaced from the rail road uh, currently our disposal of timber ties yeah, both we, timber and the concrete. we we sell them not sell them we pay a contractor to take them chip them up and take them to a uh, cogen location there's only about three or four locations in the country that do cogeneration of con or of wood ties other than that you bury them and you pay to bury them um, I'll just maybe make one last comment as a person who's in my former employment was working in the Association of American Railroads environmental research program we did a lot of work in the 1990s to understand whether creosote treated cross ties actually were posing an environmental hazard and all of the data suggested that they did not it's surprising to me that we're still fighting this battle but <laughs> um, anyway um, well, I think this has been a fantastic seminar. I really great uh, follow up with a Q and A session, and really appreciate all the interest from the students as well as our speakers' time and attention, and um, our online participants as well. So, thank you very much.